This CryptoPunk is worth $400,000 and it's the cheapest one available out of 10,000 NFTs in this collection. The reason why these are so expensive is because they were the first NFT collectibles of their kind and investors are betting that even though that doesn't matter to many people today, it absolutely will matter in the future when the NFT space grows from half a million people today to hundreds of millions of people. That same thesis explains why Facebook is rebranding themselves as a metaverse company while showing NFTs as a central part of their vision. And why Epic Games, who Fast Money called the most innovative media company in the world, is raising $1 billion to support their own metaverse pivot, while also opening the doors for NFTs to enter their video game marketplace. So today I'm gonna do my best to explain why NFTs are going to be bigger than you think. You see, I used to be a stock analyst covering the video game industry, and earlier this year, I went down the rabbit hole of NFTs and Web3, and when I finally realized the massive opportunity that this technology is gonna create in the coming years, I dropped everything and created a YouTube channel to cover this new space. I basically went all in. But I've never made a video going into all the details of why I'm so confident that hundreds of billions of dollars are going to be spent buying NFTs this decade. So I'm going to explain the bull case for NFTs in a way that you can share with anyone who might be interested in finding out why so many people are starting to become obsessed with this new movement. And here's how this video is going to be structured. So first, we're going to start with why NFTs are such a revolutionary technology, why owning an NFT can be so much more powerful than owning a physical collectible. And then we'll take a look at how big this market can get, including the four core groups of buyers that are, I think are going to be driving insane amounts of money into the space in the coming years. And then finally, I'll wrap up by talking about a superpower that NFTs have that will lead to all of this happening within an incredibly short period of time. We're talking only a few years, not decades. And guys, if you do find this interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe. My content is all about how to invest in this new technology. And believe me when I tell you that we're still incredibly early in this new cycle and things are only going to get crazier from where they are right now. Okay, now to understand why NFTs are such a big deal, we first have to understand the problem that they're solving. And funny enough, a lot of people don't even realize that there is a problem in the first place because they've grown so accustomed to things being the way they are. So when you look at the state of the internet today, you can find plenty of similarities to the real world. You have town squares where you can congregate and socialize. You have shopping districts where you can buy real world items. And you have endless entertainment, including movies, books, and video games. But until now, the internet has lacked one huge component that we do have in the real world, and that's the concept of personal property and ownership. You see, personal property is one of the fundamental building blocks of society, and the sense of owning things is deeply rooted in human psychology. But this concept is almost completely missing when it comes to the internet. What you find instead is that the internet is basically a series of applications that provide you with logins. And these logins give you temporary access to content, but you don't actually own any of it. If Twitter decides that you've broken their terms of service, they can kick you off their platform and delete your account entirely. And most people really haven't seen this as a problem because it's hard to envision an alternative. Like how can someone own something like a digital media file which lacks scarcity and seemingly flows freely throughout the internet? But it is a big problem because without you know personal ownership, we let the vast majority of the value that's created on the internet flow upwards to the companies that control these platforms. Even in cases where some of that money is returned to the creators, it's only ever a small fraction of what the platforms make from that same content. Like in the case of Spotify, where musicians often only earn 0.003 cents per stream. And so NFTs are the first technology to solve this problem, and they're going to reverse the flow of value back to the creators and the users themselves. And while we don't have time to get into the technical details of how NFTs work, the simplified version is that these are crypto assets, but unlike other cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, where you can trade one Bitcoin for another Bitcoin because they're equal to each other, just like you can trade one dollar to another dollar. NFTs are tokens that point to unique assets in the same way that you might own a house that has a unique address. And you can attach data files to these NFTs to prove exactly what it is that you own. So these can be, you know, an image or a song or even complex files such as an entire social media profile. This is going to revolutionize the way the internet works and we're just scratching the surface on all the possibilities but let me give you two major developments that we're going to start seeing immediately 
So first on the supply side of this new market, you now have an entire new class of creators that can produce digital assets that other people want to own. The most obvious beneficiary will be digital artists, whether that's visual artists or musicians, because for the first time ever, they can now add verifiable scarcity to digital goods. And if you're thinking that there's nothing stopping you from right click saving the same files to your desktop and that you're gonna get the same value this way, later on I'm gonna talk about why that counter argument actually doesn't work. And now on the buy side, since you can now have an NFT in your wallet, it means you have full control and ownership over it. And because of that, you're free to do anything that you can do with real world property. You know, you can sell it, you can transfer it. You're now even able to rent it out or to get a loan based on the NFT's value. And these assets are portable. You'll be able to move them across platforms and you won't be left at the mercy of any one corporation. And ultimately, because you can now own media files, we're gonna see people invest in culture at scale for the first time. And to put it bluntly, many people are gonna get rich when they figure this out, and many already have. Now, over the years, NFTs will take many forms, as you can see in this tweet from Punk6529. It'll spill over into gaming, you'll have big brands use it as a way to engage their audiences, and ultimately we'll see off-chain assets like property deeds transfer over to NFTs because they're a better and more transparent vehicle for that type of ownership. But today, the most common usage for NFTs is for digital collectibles and art. So let's answer a simple question. Why would anyone buy an NFT of a digital collectible? Well, one way we can understand what it is that you're actually getting from a digital collectible is by comparing it to traditional collector items like a watch or fine art. So let's take the Board Ape Yacht Club as an example. Now this is a collection set of 10,000 NFTs that represent individual pieces of art within a set. And on the other side, we have the Amazing Spider-Man comic number one. It was the first in this new comic line that came out back in 1963, and it sells for about $300,000 when in perfect mint condition. Okay, now first off, when it comes to any luxury collectible, part of the reason that you're buying it is to show off, right? You want the flex. And before you say that, you know, this is silly, just realize that this desire to flex is at least part of the reason why we buy a lot of things, you know, including nice houses, fancy cars, expensive watches and suits, etc. Now consider the flex of having a physical collectible like that Spider-Man comic book. If a flex is only as good as the number of people that get to see it, then you're limited to how many people physically come into your home, right? Until recently, that was as good as it can get, but we now live in a very different world. Studies show that on average, we spend over six hours per day on the internet. And over the course of a year, each of us spend 100 days online. And this is only gonna increase from here. And soon we're gonna have AR and VR headsets that blend the digital and the physical, and you're always gonna be connected in some way. And look, you might hate this idea, but moral judgments aside, it's an objective fact that this is the direction the world is heading. And that's why Facebook, which is, you know, one of the richest companies in the world, is spending billions of dollars a year on their metaverse pivot so that they don't get left behind. And as people spend more time online, the more impressions these NFTs get, which makes the flex even more powerful. In some cases, people use their NFTs as their profile pic on social media, and it becomes part of your personal brand, right? It tells people, you know, what hobbies you're into or even just how much money you have. And within the next couple of months, we're gonna get an integration from Twitter that essentially gives you a check mark that confirms to others that you own the NFT that you're using as your profile pic. And I expect these types of integrations to start popping up on other major platforms as well. Beyond just the intrinsic value of enjoying something that you've collected and the flex that you get from showcasing it publicly, NFTs can also give you utility through a variety of ways. First off, many of these NFT collections also act as social clubs. Last week in New York City, the Bored Apes rented an actual yacht and threw a party for all its members. It was free as long as you had an ape. All you needed to do was confirm that you actually did own it in your Ethereum wallet. Outside of utility in the physical world, holding certain NFTs will also give you access to a variety of experiences and services online. For this, you have to understand that a new internet is being developed and it's called Web3. And I'm not gonna get too into the details on this one because it's beyond the scope of this video, but just know that in the very near future, we're gonna have a ton of online applications that interact with crypto tokens. And a wallet like MetaMask will become your passport or your login to explore these applications. And depending on what tokens you hold in that wallet, you'll get different levels of access to content and experiences. So for example, let's say there's a popular crypto game and you sign in with your MetaMask wallet and it verifies that you have a bored ape in that wallet. And then what that means is that you get access to certain items within the game because they have a partnership with that collection. 
over time, more parts of the internet are going to interact with tokens in this way. And then the value or the utility of holding certain NFTs in your wallet goes up dramatically. Another form of utility comes from the creators themselves. So for example, an artist who is selling NFTs could promise that if you collect one of these NFTs and hold them in your wallet, then you'll get first access or discounts on future projects that they release. If you believe the artist has potential to grow their personal brand, then you can make a killing by getting good deals on a collection that is destined to get more demand in the future. And then finally, in many cases, you also get access to a community as well. So many of these NFTs come with gated communities like online forums, discords, etc., that let you make connections with others. So that's a quick overview of how powerful these NFT collectibles can be. And as you can see, you know, the argument that you can just right click save these images to your desktop and get the same amount of value is pretty silly if you think about it for more than like two seconds. First, once all the platforms build ways to recognize NFT ownership, then pretending you own something that you don't is gonna hurt your reputation, not help it. It's gonna be like wearing a fake watch, but in this case, there's gonna be a giant sticker on the watch that says, this is a fake watch. And beyond that, you're not gonna get any of the additional utility that would require that you actually hold the NFT in your wallet. Okay, with all that said, I now wanna talk about the opportunity that I'm seeing for anyone who jumps into this space today. You see, we're still early in this NFT and Web3 cycle, very early. The most popular NFT platforms combined see about $3 billion in volume in a single month, which sounds like a lot until you realize that a meme coin like Shiba Inu or Dogecoin can get $30 billion in volume during a single day. I strongly believe that in the next few years, this space is gonna grow from you know, the current half a million monthly buyers to tens of millions of monthly buyers. And the amount of money that's gonna flow into this space is going to far exceed most people's expectations. And to make the case, let me show you four groups of NFT buyers that are gonna push this space into escape velocity in the next few years. The first group is the most obvious because they've already been driving in the NFT market until today. And to put it bluntly, I'm talking about rich crypto people. You see, as you may know, cryptocurrencies like Ethereum and Bitcoin have shown the fastest appreciation of any major asset class in history. For example, it took Microsoft and Apple more than 40 years to reach $1 trillion in market value, while Bitcoin was able to do it in just 12 years. Bitcoin is also growing at a faster rate than the internet did and is projected to hit 1 billion users within the next four years. And this has led to an unprecedented transfer of wealth to a new generation of people. Today, it's estimated that there are 100,000 Bitcoin millionaires. And by some calculations, if Bitcoin reaches a price of 200,000, it would mean that half of the world's billionaires would come from crypto. In other words, these are incredibly wealthy, tech savvy, crypto native people that prefer anonymity and basically live on the internet. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you sent me to the lab and asked me to create the ideal NFT buyer, I wouldn't be able to come up with a better candidate than this. When these crypto millionaires and billionaires decide to flaunt their wealth or even to become patrons of the arts, they're going to overwhelmingly choose crypto native assets like NFTs over physical real world purchases like cars or fine art. Okay, now in group number two, we have the younger generations, mainly millennials and Gen Z. Here we have the first generations that grew up with the internet and the ones most comfortable with making internet native purchases. Specifically, over the last 10 years or so, we've seen an incredible boom in young people who buy cosmetic items in games like Fortnite, where people spend up to $5.5 billion in a single year on cosmetic digital avatars. And while these generations aren't known for being rich, that's actually about to change because you see we have the baby boomers who have amassed tens of trillions of dollars. You know, they're actually the wealthiest generation of all time and they're about to pass that along to their children. According to some studies, by 2030, millennials will hold five times as much wealth as they have today and they're expected to inherit over $68 trillion from their predecessors. So in other words, you have the generation that is most comfortable with the internet and with crypto. They're the most likely to buy digital assets like cosmetic avatars in video games and they're about to get much wealthier than they are today. And if my YouTube stats reflect the actual market, then more than 70% of people interested in NFTs are under the age of 35, which means they're also more likely to understand the value of digital property rights. Okay, now moving on to group number three, you have traditional collectors. So basically rich people who already spend obscene amounts of money on art and other real world collectibles. The collectibles market, excluding NFTs, is already a $370 billion market. 
This includes fine art, which is a $67 billion market, as well as antiques, comic books, cars, watches, you name it. There's obviously a lot of money in the system right now, and people are looking for ways to flaunt it, sometimes even paying hundreds of millions of dollars for a single painting. And we're getting signs that traditional collectors are opening up to digital assets as well. World-class auction houses like Christie's began selling NFTs side by side with other fine art earlier this year, and they've already broken $100 million in sales in less than a year. And elite art shows like Art Basel in Miami are also starting to add NFTs into their galleries. It's fairly obvious that, you know, the big money is going to come in. And because of that, you've seen, you know, crypto collectors buy NFTs of so-called blue chip artists to try to position themselves before this wave of new collectors arrive. And then finally, in group number four, you have culture traders. And let me show you something real quick to help you understand why this group is going to be so big. This is an article in the Wall Street Journal from a couple of weeks ago talking about the golden age that venture capital is in right now. Specifically, the value of US-based venture-backed companies that went public or were acquired this year through the third quarter totaled $582 billion, up from $289 billion in 2020 and surpassing half a trillion dollars for the first time ever. And you can see here that the money being made from investing in private companies is up massively in the last few years compared to prior decades. And in another article by the University of Chicago, we see this quote, What's astonishing is the average venture fund has been beating the S&P 500 by 60% to 100% over the last 10 years. And by most accounts, this isn't going to slow down because what we're seeing is an era of disruption where the incumbent companies in the public stock market are being slowly replaced by technology companies that are starting in the private markets. And this is a cycle that is expected to continue. But here's the catch. You see, the average person can buy stocks, so they have access to, you know, the companies that are being disrupted, but they can't actually buy into the private companies that are doing the disruption. And this is because, you know, in the US at least, we have accredited investor laws that put very strict restrictions on who can actually participate in this new economy. You know, guidelines like needing to have over $1 million in net worth. At the same time that this is all happening, I think NFTs will emerge as an alternative asset class that can gain, you know, mainstream adoption with investors of all ages who feel like, you know, their only other options are investing in the stock market, which feels like a great game, or amassing a net worth of a million dollars to be able to invest in these private technology companies. And in general, in this decade, I think we're going to be talking a lot about the value of memes. And you're going to be seeing stories of people making ridiculous money just by figuring out how to, you know, assess and understand the value of certain cultural artifacts. Okay, so congrats if you made it this far. Now, as I promised, I'm going to tell you the secret weapon that NFTs and Web3 have that basically ensures that this all plays out faster than any tech development cycle before them. And the secret weapon that I'm referring to is open source development. You see, NFTs borrow the open source philosophy from crypto, which means that all the code and all the smart contracts are available to the public. This means that new innovations can be immediately copied into other projects. And this means that, you know, the space as a whole moves at basically light speed compared to what we're used to from the traditional tech world. And to give you an example of how this is a radical change, let's consider the smartphone industry. So in 2011, we got the Motorola Atrix, which was the first phone to produce a fingerprint scanner. Yet it took two more years before we saw the same feature in the iPhone 5S, and then several more years before they became common across other smartphones. These developments take longer because each company keeps their code locked away. And that means that each company has to solve, you know, the problem of fingerprint scanners individually one by one. With Web3, each innovation only has to be built once. And so if you have one team that figures out a better way of setting up royalties, then that code can be immediately copied into another project. And now team number two doesn't have to waste time, you know, trying to reverse engineer how they set up the royalties in the first place. And so they can use their energy instead on building a additional innovations. And now imagine, you know, hundreds or thousands of different teams building on top of each other in real time. And you can see that the tech evolution that we're used to seeing play out over the course of, you know, decades in the traditional tech world can now play out in a matter of years or even months in Web3. This means that a year from now, this video might need to be updated with, you know, a thousand new powerful innovations that you can get out of NFTs that is impossible or that we can even think about today. All right, guys, hope that was helpful. I hope I made you a little more excited about the future of NFTs. Thanks again for watching and I'll catch you with the next video.